I am E.R. Ship, and I'm an associate professor of journalism in the School of Global Journalism and Communication. We welcome you to the Gilliam Concert Hall tonight, and I hope you know that this evening's program is being live streamed. It's also being carried one way or the other through social media. So our audience is actually much larger than what you see here. My primary role at this point in the program is to bring our president, Dr. David Wilson, to the stage. He will tell you more about the Distinguished Speaker Series. And then you will have an introduction of our speaker tonight, the Reverend Alfred Charles Sharpton, Jr., better known as Reverend Al. Following Reverend Sharpton's lecture, I will moderate a short question and answer period. And now, Dr. Wilson. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Professor E.R. Ship, uh, for your comments uh, and for moderating the panel. Uh, for those of you who perhaps who are not affiliated with our university, uh, Professor E.R. Ship is a professor in the School of Global Journalism and Communication here at Morgan, and she is a Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, and so please join me in <laughs> applauding that accomplishment. Uh, but I really just wanted to welcome you uh, once again to the Presidential Distinguished Speaker Series here at Morgan State University. Uh, this series really commenced in 2016, uh, and it is designed to bring some of the nation's leading and most provocative thought leaders from various disciplines and professional fields of study to the university exposing our university community to a broad range of views and perspectives and angles on the myriad of opportunities, if you will, and challenges that we face as a nation. That is really in keeping with Morgan's mission of serving as a premier public urban research university that is rooted very proudly in the historically black college and university tradition. This series is designed to promote here at Morgan what we called mind expansion. It is designed to enable all of us to wrestle with the issues of the past, to wrestle with the challenges of the present, uh, and to imagine the possibilities of tomorrow. And so tonight, uh, we turn our attention to politics. Uh, we will hear from an individual who will, if you know Reverend Sharpton, opine and challenge us to think deeply about the role of civil rights, and I'm sure a lot of other things, in the age of Trump. Now, many of you know that in this series, we seek out and have sought out individuals who are on the cutting edge of innovation, individuals who really have the ability to see around corners, and individuals who are able to imagine, if you will, in America, imagine a nation that we all love that is truly inclusive, in America that is equitable, in America that is fair, in America that is just, in America that we all see ourselves in. And so in doing so, I hope that we are showing our students and indeed our wider community what it really means when we here at Morgan say that we are growing the future and leading the world. We value here at Morgan the free expression of ideas. We value free speech. We don't need an executive order to do that. 
and we value, if you will, the diversity of views and opinions. And so as president, I understand the importance of our students being exposed to a multifaceted point of view. For such views, in my view, can lead to greatness in thought and to greatness of possibilities. And so with that said, I'm really, really happy that you have joined us this evening. I see you know, several hundred of you here in the audience. And as Professor Ship indicated, this is being screened live, or streamed live, I should say. Uh, and literally thousands of individuals are joining us uh, via uh, social media. Uh, and so now, uh, I would like to bring forward one of our students uh, who is a member of the Presidential Leadership Circle, uh, an entity that I brought to our campus a few years ago uh, to basically enable a group of students here at Morgan uh, to really kind of shatter their president, uh, to understand what leadership can mean writ large. And so I'm very pleased to introduce to you this evening Mr. Vincent Anangubu, uh, who is a member of the President Leadership Circle, who will officially introduce our speaker in the Presidential Distinguished Speaker Series, Reverend Al Sharpton. Please join me in welcoming Vincent. Good evening, Morgan. So my name is Vincent Ananabo. I'm a senior um, and a fellow of the President's Leadership Circle. And again, I'd like to thank you all for coming out to today's Presidential Distinguished Speaker Series. And tonight, I have the honor of introducing to you the one and only Reverend Al Sharpton. Reverend Sharpton is the founder and president of the National Action Network, which is a nonprofit organization that was formed in 1991 and has more than 100 chapters nationwide. Reverend Sharpton has been recognized as one of the nation's most renowned civil rights leaders and also has been praised by President Barack Obama as the voice of the voiceless and the champion of the downtrodden. The Reverend hosts a daily show on the radio and a national television news show and is also an established author. When I think of Reverend Al Sharpton, I think of activism. And I also think of a man at the forefront of civil rights in America today. So please, welcome, please help me in welcoming the incomparable Reverend Al Sharpton. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent, and to Dr. Wilson and to E.R. Ship, and to all of you that are here tonight. I'm certainly honored to be part of the series that President does here. I think it is very important that you hear yourself from people that are involved in various disciplines. As I was uh, given the title of civil rights in the age of Donald Trump, let me first start with the premise. I started in civil rights activism very young. And I was, I joined a group called Operation Breadbasket when I was 12 years old. I had been a boy preacher in the Church of God in Christ. And uh, my mother, became concerned because it was the very late 60s and I kept becoming more and more enthralled with what I was seeing on the news in Brooklyn, New York, where I was born and raised. And she was afraid I was going to go out and join some group that would get me in trouble. So she brought me to our bishop and he said, no, I know some ministers had worked with Dr. King that lead the New York chapter. She brought me to a Reverend William Jones who was in charge. And they took me in. By the age 13, I became their youth director. The national head was twice my age, Reverend Jesse Jackson and Reverend Jones. And from then on, I was involved in civil rights. At the same time, and I'm just laying out the premise so you know from what I speak from, <clears throat> by the mid-80s, I met a man that had been 
frequented in the newspapers in New York and who had fought a housing discrimination lawsuit against himself in his real estate business, he and his father, and his name was Donald Trump. So I speak as one that have dealt in civil rights for decades and one that has known Donald Trump for decades. And you will know by the end of my speech which one means the most to me. When I look at the last several decades of Mr. Trump, when I first heard of him in the 80s and he was fighting a, a housing discrimination lawsuit, clearly we did not like what we saw. But as time went on, he would begin socializing with some in the music world and he became close with a fight promoter named Don King, who introduced us because he wanted, he being Trump, to get Mike Tyson, who was then heavyweight champion of the world, and wanted to get him to fight in Atlantic City. He felt that we would try to talk Tyson out of it, and he wanted to try and convince me he was all right and he would do the right thing. And he had Tyson fight Larry Holmes and Michael Spinks in Atlantic City where he held exclusive contract on the convention center there in Atlantic City. A few years later, there was a case that made national news where a young white female was brutally and viciously raped and assaulted in Central Park. That night, they rounded up several young black and Latino boys, brought them to the precinct, didn't let their parents in, didn't let lawyers in, and got them to confess to a crime that they did not do. One of them's grandmother called me, Michael Briscoe was his name, and said to me, because I had done several cases then, that her son, grandson was innocent, and she wanted our help. And I became involved in what became known as the Central Park Five case. Those young men said they were coerced into confessions, put on trial, and was convicted. And some did 13 to 15 years in jail. At the beginning of the case, Donald Trump, who had never taken a position on civil rights or race cases in New York, bought full-page ads calling for the death penalty on those young boys. And that was the only time I can remember he took a position on a race-based case in New York. As God would have it, some would say fate. Several years later, after doing all this time, a inmate talking to some cellmate told them 15 years later that, you remember the Central Park case? He said, yeah, he said, I did that. Those guys didn't do it. The cellmate told the correction officers, trying to get out of jail, and they did a DNA test. Because at the time the rape happened, DNA had not been perfected to that degree. They did a DNA test on him and the DNA they had on the young lady. In fact, Ava uh, DuVernay is getting ready to release a movie on this case. And found the DNA matched, and these young five young men were telling the truth. They were not involved. They were released from jail. And where do you go to get a job when you have done 12, 13 to 15 years in jail? One of them, Carrie Weiss, ended up working for National Action Network, our organization. I can't tell you how castigated we were when the case was going on that we would defend them. But he ended up working for us and was vindicated. And the city settled with them for what they went through for several million dollars. But then Donald Trump was a big reality TV star and he said even then, they shouldn't get one dime, they were guilty, he didn't care what 
he said. That's the Donald Trump I know. So needless to say, I was not thrilled when he was elected president of the United States. Under Donald Trump's presidency, tonight we sit in a very polarized nation. But aside from the attitudes, the facts speak for themselves. And the facts I raise not to just attack Trump, which is easy. He gives you a lot to work with. The facts are the challenge for you to be able to deal with this, not only in his presidency, but as you grow into leadership in this country. One out of every three black men in this country at some point in life is engaged in being incarcerated or some kind of encounter with law enforcement, one in three. The poverty level of blacks, 20% of blacks live below the poverty line, whereas only 10% of whites live there. If you look at income, President Trump brags that unemployment rate is lower under him than it's ever been, but is still twice the rate of unemployment to whites. Black unemployment, 7.6%, went up to 7.8%, whites a little over 3%. So it is better because the economy is stronger, which started under President Obama, by the way, but it is still not equal. So to tell me that you're better, but you're still not equal is not to deal with the race gap that is still very much a part of this country. Malcolm X used to say that if you have a knife in my back six inches and take it out three inches, that might be progress, but you still got three inches of knife in my back. To brag about low unemployment when it is double at the white and not deal with how we close the race gap is something that we need to deal with in this country. When you look at the income level, blacks make 60s, uh, white, w w white women, let me start there. White women make 66 cents to every white male, 79 cents. Black women less, 66 cents. Blacks make 79 cents. So even when it comes to wages, we are still unequal with wages. So you're going in a world that is structurally unequal. It is not just based on Republican and Democrat. There is a structural race gap in this country that has not been closed. Yes, the civil rights movement of the 60s got a lot done. It got us from the back of the bus. It got us where we could go and use public accommodation. We didn't have to sit in the back of the bus anymore. We, did, we could use hotels. We could use uh, restaurants. We became free but not equal. And the challenge for your generation is equality. To have the right to do things that you cannot equally afford does not mean that you have achieved what we want to achieve in terms of equality in this country. I travel a lot. I flew yesterday from Raleigh, North Carolina back to New York. Halfway through the flight, we hit a lot of turbulence, plane going up and down, up and down, up and down. For about an hour of the flight, we was jolted one way or another. Finally, we hit smooth air. And for about 40 minutes, it flew very easy. But nobody got off the plane because we got out of the turbulence. We waited until we arrived at Raleigh Airport. Just because all of the insults of the 60s may be gone, does not mean we've arrived at an airport of freedom. We still have a long way to go before we are treated equal in this country. <laughs> Challenge of your generation is to close the race gap. 
in education, in economics, in our criminal justice system, in the issues that we raise, and even some of the things that were gained in the 60s under Dr. King, voting rights, civil rights are definitely being challenged and attempted to be eroded. When you look at the fact that we had the right to vote came out of slavery with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, right after, let, let me start there for a minute. Civil War, fight between the South and the North. The Confederates began picking up steam. The abolitionists, including Frederick Douglass, who came from Maryland, came from here, were saying free slaves, there should not be slaves. Abraham Lincoln was not an abolitionist. Abraham Lincoln, in fact, was reluctant about freeing the slaves. After much prodding and the gaining of the Confederate Army coming north, where they had gotten as far as Virginia, even his generals told him, you need to let blacks join the Union Army so we have the manpower to beat the Confederates and save the country. Had they lost the Civil War, he would no longer have been president, they would have overthrown the government, and there would have been a new established order. Lincoln reluctantly freed the blacks in slave states, didn't free them in the North, in slave states. Let them join the Union Army, and even then we didn't get the same pay that the other soldiers got. And they won the Civil War because of the blacks that had been enslaved became part of the Union Army. So when you hear the story that Lincoln freed the slaves, the truth is the slaves freed Lincoln. <laughs> After he freed them, after there became a growth in him, and they went into establishing the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, giving men, black men, and white men the right to vote constitutionally, not women, that you could no longer have servitude other than those incarcerated. All of these kinds of moves, immediately after that, Lincoln was killed, and there was a backlash. His vice president, Andrew Johnson, came in office, and he had one of the most, most presidential backlash administrations in recorded history. Step forward, step backward. And if you go through every period where there was advancement in terms of race in this country, it was always followed with a pushback or a backlash to try and undo what had been done. That is the pattern of American history. So it was no surprise to me that when we elected in 2008, the first black president, Barack Obama, and then re-elected him in 2012, that there was going to be some backlash to the United States having a black president. Not only having one, but one that changed a lot of things that they had never seen. First of all, the economy was gone. We were in a deep recession headed toward a depression. He recovered the economy. He passed the first Affordable Care Act that they've been trying to do for 60 years. On and on and on, opened up Cuba. Many things that Obama did, but a backlash was gonna come. Now, I did not know the backlash would be in the person of Donald Trump. But if you understand the kind of emotions and the kind of feelings that many had, you would then understand that all of the outrageous behavior that Donald Trump exhibited even during the campaign, they were willing to excuse because they wanted the backlash to the things that Obama had done. 
So people talk about he can't be president. Nobody's going to take him seriously. Yes, they would if they felt they would put someone in that would stand up in a brash way. What did he campaign on? He came into politics saying, first, it's us against them, birtherism. President Obama's not one of us. I mean, it's inconceivable. You're going to ask the President of the United States for his birth certificate. He's fighting now, talking about going all the way to the Supreme Court not to give his taxes when he asked the President for his birth certificate. <laughs> Said he wanted to see his grades in school <laughs> because President Obama had gone to Columbia University on the Harvard, was the first black to be the editor of the Harvard Law Journal. He wanted to see his grades, yet he will not release his grades. Backlash, he's not one of us. The subtle message in asking for his birth certificate is the dog whistle to America that he's not really American, he's not us. And that resounded with enough people, it resonated with enough people, that he became president of the United States. First thing he announced when he won is that he was going to revoke the Affordable Care Act, he was going to revoke all the things that President Obama did, which was very interesting to me because a lot of people, including some in the black community, was saying Obama didn't do anything. Well, if Obama didn't do anything, then what is Trump undoing? <laughs> so here we are in 2019, first time that I can remember in my lifetime that we don't even have an identified black in the West Wing of the White House. Think about that. Every president since Roosevelt, there was a black that had power in the White House, Republican or Democrat, that black America could go to to plead their case and try to get things done. You cannot name a black in any position of power on the West Wing of the White House. The White House today looks like the Rocky Mountains. The higher up you get, the whiter it gets. <laughs> One black they had, Amarosa, is now calling the president a racist. <laughs> so the climate that you are now educating yourself in and preparing yourself for life in is a climate where you've had the great achievement politically of a black president and you've had now one of the most polarizing presidencies in recorded American history. Just today, a white 21-year-old young man was arrested for burning three black churches in Louisiana. Today, we've had any number of racial incidents and including police encounters like the great case here in Baltimore where they don't even hardly cover it on the news now. And then those of us that stand up on those cases, we accuse of just wanting attention. They're just trying to get publicity. People will say, oh, here comes Al Sharpton again. He just wants publicity. Well, that's exactly what I want. <laughs> Nobody calls me to keep a secret. <laughs> Trayvon Martin's mother called me. I never even heard of Trayvon Martin's case. When I went down and we started rallying in Florida, it was to get publicity. Same thing with Eric Gardner's case. Same thing just last year with Stephon Clark in Sacramento. Police shot him in the back six times in his grandmother's backyard. Don't let people demonize those that stand up and make people understand what you're going through, and you start fighting them that are fighting for you. The, 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 the reality is that we have been 
tricked into fighting each other rather than fighting those that are opposed to us because of what our circumstances are. That's why we must have historic black colleges because we need to be able to have our experiences shared and understand what we're doing. I was telling some young folks when I went to Ferguson to preach Michael Brown's funeral who was killed by police. Parents called me and they were saying, well, problem is the old the folks don't understand us. I said, well, that, that's always been the case. I, every time, all young people fought older people. That ain't new. I fought Reverend Jones, Reverend Jackson. That's nothing new. But all of us are given the same social circumstances. Then you hear the media. Oh, there's a division between the generations. 2016 race. It's the old against the young. But the political youth leader in America was 72 years old, Bernie Sanders. So I don't understand young blacks that didn't want to hear older black leaders but wanted to help Bernie, who was older than all of us. <laughs> but if we allow ourselves not to delve into the reality of the situation, rather than being caught into a lot of just slogans and name calling, we will not solve the problem. And if we're not careful, we will exacerbate our own problem. <laughs> I hear often as I speak at colleges, well, I don't like the traditional organizations. Well, good, form one. <laughs> I don't like the older leaders. Well, good, lead. Nobody in your way. When I got to uh, Sacramento, brother met me at, uh, at the family's house, and he said, I don't get along with the head of the uh, local NAACP. I said, okay, what were you getting ready to organize that they stopped you from doing? <laughs> well, not, well, then what are you mad with them for? Whatever they doing, let them do that. Nobody's stopping you. You didn't call a rally and they call it off. You didn't call a march and they got in the road and stopped you. We find it easier to fight each other because there's no penalty fighting each other. It don't take courage to fight each other. But to stand up and fight those in power, you know you may be held accounted and you may have to pay a price. It is a challenge when we see the social institutions that are stacked against us. And the challenge you must have is to confront them and equalize them. I was saying earlier, to some brothers here, we were talking on the local uh, NPR station. When you look at, I was riding to the campus and you ride down Fulton Avenue, just blocks and blocks of abandoned buildings. I'm not talking about back in the day. I'm talking about tonight. <laughs> Everybody talking about, well, you know, I couldn't have been a slave. I wouldn't have took that. I, I couldn't have been in segregation. I wasn't sitting in the back of nobody's But Where you living in Baltimore? <laughs> where they got blocks and blocks of buildings that they take pension fund money, pension fund from city workers, state workers, union members, give the money to white managers who then invest the money with developers who come in and buy all of those blocks, move you out of your neighborhood, build high-rise condos, make millions of dollars where you was living in squalor, and it's your money they invested. So grandma's pension, she paid a pension every week got a paycheck, is financing the removal of her from her own house. Bad enough we get gentrified, it's worse that we paying for it. I spoke at the union not long ago. 80% of the members of the union, black and Latino. I asked them, who manages your pension fund? They didn't even know. 
because we are not thought, thinking economics, we are thinking crabs in the barrel. Somebody get more than I'm getting that look like me. And if you have the, the way you solve crabs in the barrel of clawing on each other's back, the way you solve the crabs in the barrel syndrome is the crabs need to get together and lift the lid off the barrel and there'll be enough room for all the crabs. We must deal with economic issues. We must deal with access to capital. There's nothing ingenious about getting money to build buildings. We can build them if we could get the capital. We could build restaurants. I, I go through Harlem now, and I see people sitting out in the middle of the night that have been gentrified in Harlem, sitting in the sidewalk, sipping mint tulips. There wasn't nothing genius. They could get capital to open cafes. And we can't get the capital. The banks won't loan the money. The money managers won't loan the money. So we need to organize where those institutions either do business with us properly or we don't support those institutions. <laughs> Suppose if every church in Baltimore said we all gonna bank at one bank and even in the middle of all, all the way down Fulton Avenue, there were liquor stores and three churches. I don't even know how they met in one church because the whole building looked like a kid. But to come to Jesus so-and-so church. <laughs> and if all of them got together and said we gonna just bank in one bank, but that bank it must guarantee us they're gonna loan to our businesses. They're going to open doors for our business opportunities, business loans, and we're going to make the city council give us zoning so that we can do that. That represents power. But if we never consolidate it, how are we ever going to get out of this rut doing the same thing? We buy brands that we don't own. We argue about do you got this brand or that brand. That ain't what's happening this way. Ain't none of it happening if you don't own it. <laughs> Economically, we must begin to organize and put our consumer dollars together as leverage to get things done. Politically, we must, politics is of no use if it does not protect an economic order. Last week, we had National Action Network organization I founded convention in New York. And I questioned, we had 14 of the presidential candidates. I questioned them about reparations. I wanted to put them on the record. Why? We've been fighting reparations for years. Many groups fighting it today. Been out there a long time. And they put the issue out there. But I wanted them to commit so that we could take out of acting like it's some marginal thing that it is owed to us and therefore the investments must be made. Sheila Jackson Lee has HR 40, which is a House of Representatives bill to deal with a commission on how we get to reparations. People say, well, how are we gonna get it? Well, first, let's acknowledge you owe it. Let's start there. Brandon Robinson wrote a book years ago called The Debt. If I owe you money, the argument is not whether I'm going to pay you in single bills or large bills. First, I need to acknowledge I owe you. And they have never conceded the debt that they owe. Why do you say they owe the debt? Well, if you enslaved us for 247 years, made it against the law for us to read and write, made it against the law for us to marry, sold our families to different states never to be reconciled, and then free us. We are illiterate, we have family breakdown, and our children can't come to us to learn because we could not teach what we did not know. 
and we're only three or four generations out of that. So it's not what you did to grandma, what you did to grandma, I had to suffer because grandma couldn't give me what the other grandmas could give them. There was no wealth that we inherited because you couldn't own property. So they start with an advantage. And the defense is, well, I didn't do that. My grandfather did. Well, if we're doing a race between teams and you have, you start the race by giving someone 30 feet advantage and he passes the baton to someone who inherits that 30 feet and they pass it on to somebody else who inherits that, he may not have started the unequal race, but he is running with the advantage of a perverted, distorted start. And you got to pay for that mileage that you took and forced. Otherwise, how do you ever make it equal? If we can take reparations for others, we can take it for us. That is a legitimate political position. Oh, that's far left. Paper shop and making the Democrats go too far to the left. No, I'm dealing with American history. And if we don't stand up and deal with that, we will never be able to equalize these things. You inherit, with all of these disadvantages, you inherit a generation that has the ability to do more than the preceding generations. But don't get confused. You inherited that because the people that preceded you fought for you to have a better life than they did. They did not wake up one morning and say, let's be nice to Negroes. They were forced with organized movements and organized pressure to deal with that. Don't ever forget that people suffered and some lost their lives so that you could have opportunities they did not have. And you therefore ought to be fighting so that your younger sisters and brothers and your children when you have them can advance more than you because that's what was done for you. I, I remember one night I was debating a self-described black conservative. And he said to me, Reverend Sharpton, I'm not into all that protest and marching you do. I'm not into all of that. I didn't make it march and I made it because I went to the best schools and I was a member of the right fraternities and I have the right connections. Look at my resume. I took his resume, I looked at it, I said, yes, it's very impressive. You did go to the right schools, you're in the right fraternities, you have the right references. I said, but don't you ever forget that it was some unlettered, illiterate grandmothers that lay down in the streets in Birmingham, Alabama, in front of biting dogs, and spent cold nights in jail. Some went to their grave so you could go to those good universities. <laughs> Didn't nobody invite you in, you were sponsored on the backs of people that didn't have the opportunities you had. And even if you're not going to be involved, at least don't be ungrateful. <laughs> Lastly, let me say it's a personal commitment. All of us in here have to believe in not only our people, but we must believe in ourselves. The hardest thing that you must overcome in your life is your lack of confidence in yourself. You must believe in you and your ability if nobody else believes in it. You could have the best teachers in Morgan State, but if they believe in you more than you believe in yourself, you will never grow into your full potential. I had to learn that it is not 
about who's on my side is about me being on my side. Vincent read my bio, but the one thing he left out, and that is that I'm the chairman, president, secretary, treasurer, and sometime only member of the Al Sharpton fan club. I get up every morning, call a membership meeting in the bathroom. <laughs> Look in the mirror, you can do it, Al. Go, Al. Don't listen to them, Al. By the time I come out the bathroom, I'm ready for the day because we have had a meeting and decided there was nothing we wasn't going to do. <laughs> well, Red Al, you don't know my background. I know. Whatever you come from, whatever your circumstance was, there's somebody worse than you that still went ahead. You are not responsible for how you were born and where you were born and the family you was born. There was no multiple choice given you of what race you wanted to be. Check that off before you was born. What kind of mother and father you want to have, what neighborhood. That went up to you. But what is up to you is what you do with the circumstances you were born in. When I was born, my father was a businessman. He was an entrepreneur. Had a nice home. Bought a new Cadillac every year. I woke up one morning, nine years old. He abandoned us. Left. Had to move to the hood. No Cadillac. They repossessed it. Couldn't even pay the light bill. I had to do homework by candlelight. Mother, who was a businesswoman, ended up a domestic worker. I had to scrub floors. I used to walk her to the subway, Saratoga and Livonia and Brownsville every morning. And she would go downtown to scrub folks' floors. But she put in me, she said, life is not about where you start. Life is about where you're headed. And don't let nobody tell you what you can't be. When I was 16, I met a young man named Teddy. And Teddy came and joined my youth civil rights group. After a while, I found out his father was a big entertainer. Teddy ended up getting killed about a year later in a car accident in New York. He was from Georgia. The local disc jockey told his father, if you want to do something for Teddy, there's this young teenage preacher. Got a civil rights group. You should do it in honor of Teddy with him. And his father came and did the concert, gave a little of the money to our youth group, and I became a replacement for Teddy. I was the same age as Teddy. His father was the godfather of Soul James Brown. Over the next couple of years, he'd send for me, came to Baltimore, he's on the radio station here. 1982, Ronald Reagan was the president. And we were all fighting, and Mrs. Martin Luther King, Coretta Scott King, and others, we were fighting to get a national holiday for Dr. King's birthday. And I told James Brown, who was very conservative, close to Republicans, we used to argue politics all the time. I said, you, you should call your friends and tell them we need a national holiday. He said, his secretary, we were in his office in Augusta, Georgia. He said, get the White House on the phone. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> and they put the call through. It's about 11 in the morning. And I hung around all day. We doing other things, forgot about it. About 3 o'clock, secretary hit him on the intercom and said, the White House is on the phone. I looked. He picked up the phone and told him he wanted to see President Ray about Dr. King having a national holiday. They called back in an hour and said that the president will see you January 15, 1982, which was King's birthday, but it was not a holiday. James Brown looked at me and said, I'm going to take you with me. It's the first time I went to the White House. But we got on the plane, headed up that January. And while we was on the plane, he looked over at me. We sit up in first class, bodyguards in the back. He said, Reverend, he never called me out. Always called me by my title. Wanted me to live up to it. He said, Reverend, 
He said, I want you to do me a favor. I said, what's that? He said, when we land, I'm going to take you by my friend Bobby Bennett, who styles my hair. And I want you to do your hair just like mine. <laughs> Nobody knew who I was in 82. I said, all right. <laughs> he took me and conked my hair. And I walked in the White House with him, looked like his son. <laughs> but as the years went by, he said to me, don't ever change your hair. That's me and your bond. And the reason I didn't is because no man had ever asked me to be like them. My daddy never asked me to be like him. I graduated junior high school, and high school daddy wasn't there, didn't know where he was, didn't talk to him for 20 years. He gave me an affirmation that I didn't have. So even when my critics say, why he got that mess in his head, they didn't understand that he validated in me a sense of self-esteem. And what I'm telling you is you must validate yourself. And it doesn't matter who laughs at it, doesn't matter who ridicules it, somebody sees something in you, you hold on to that and be that for yourself. Because if you look at the world, look at, look at, I fly like, I look at the elements, I look at nature. Sun never bumped into the moon. Stars never bumped into the earth. Everything operates in perfect precision. So why do you think out of the thousands of years the earth has been here that God got to you and made his first mistake? You are not a mistake. You are not an accident. Those dreams, those things that drive you are not accidental. You got to lock into them and believe it. Nobody thought that anybody could do anything until they did it. And if you never learn anything else, learn that whatever is yearning in you, you don't need anybody to co-sign it. You need to believe it and do it and dream it for yourself. If you don't learn anything else, learn that your greatness is in you. And if nobody sees it but you, that's all right too. I was going through LaGuardia Airport the other day. I'll end on this and answer questions. About a, two years ago, a lady stopped me. She said, Reverend Al, I said, yes, ma'am. Guy traveled with me, said, we're running for a plane. She says, I just want to ask you a question. I said, okay. She said, do you remember a lady named Ms. Barker? I stopped. I said, yeah. Ms. Barker was a teacher of mine in junior high school. She asked me what I wanted to be. I said, well, I'm a boy preacher. She laughed. I said, no, in our church, you can start young. She said, well, what are you going to study in high school? I said, I'm going to finish high school, go on and study theology. I'm going to be a learned preacher. She said, Al, learn to do something with your hands. You can't do that. You can't. And she began telling me the limitations of a young black kid in school in the 60s. But I kept on doing what I was doing. I said to this lady, yeah, I remember her. I didn't tell her why I remembered her, but I remembered her. She said, well, she's my mother. I said, Ms. Barker, is your mother? She said, yeah. I said, she's still alive? She said, yes, she's still alive. And you know what? I said, what? She said, every Saturday evening, she's old and feeble now, we all go and visit her some weekends and we know we can't talk because she sits at the TV and watches your television show. <laughs> what makes me keep going is the Miss Barkers that never thought I'd be nothing. They're sitting home watching my TV show. Don't let nobody tell you what you can be. Don't let nobody tell you who you can be. You 
were born for a reason, not just for a season. Trump is in the White House now, but he'll be gone. You've got to grow and be part of a movement that equalizes America by being the best of the ultimate of what you was born to be. If you don't remember anything I told you tonight, remember, you're not an accident. You're here for a reason, and grow and be that reason. Thank you, and God bless you. going to have that. Oh. Thank you, Reverend Sharpton. I'm going to ask Reverend Sharpton a couple of questions. I think you see there are microphones on either side of the room. We're going to have a brief period of question and answer. And once we open it up to the audience, please remember we have a very brief period and you need to ask questions, not give speeches. Okay, I'm going to start. Uh, continuing, uh, Reverend Sharpton, with some lessons that our audience, particularly our young people, can learn from your life. So I'm going to ask you about, back in the day, when I was a reporter at the New York Times and a columnist at the Daily News, um, neither your political language nor the range of issues you focused on was as expansive and as inclusive as they have become over time. Um, in your Howard Beach and Tawana Brawley years, the movement was not always the big tent one that included women's rights, LGBTQ rights, or even international perspectives. Can you explain your evolution and the role of scholar activists like Cornell West in that evolution? <clears throat> I, I think that over a period of time as you grow in the movement, you have to be honest enough to critique why you need to do things in a more expansive way. In order to help those that you claim you want to serve, you've got to be able to work with others in order to achieve things, and they need to be able to work with you. And I recognize that you can't fight for your rights if you're not going to fight for everybody's rights. And therefore, whether I agree with somebody or not, I've got to fight for their rights. Uh, so in, I remember when I came out for LGBTQ rights, my sister was gay uh, from when I was a kid. And she said, so let me get this right. You're in civil rights, but you're going to decide who I can love. And as I grew, some of, the, of my colleagues who you knew, uh, uh, attacked me for it. But you, you've got to at some time come to terms with yourself and grow and grow and grow and not be afraid to grow. So I think that we had to grow from a narrow view to understand that you're not less black to work with others. In fact, if you're afraid to work with others, you're insecure about your blackness. I'm as black now as I was in the 80s, but I can work with everybody else and they can be whatever they are, whether it be Latino, whether it be white, whether it be Jewish, whether it be gay, they ain't got to give up themselves to work with me and I know who I am working with them because unless everybody have rights, then you're still having a threat to your own rights. In working with coalitions, um, Cornell West didn't teach me that. Dr. King's books taught me that. <laughs> but Cornell is a good uh, philosopher and thinker. In working with coalitions, we've seen that in the Women's March and even with what's become the Me Too movement, not what it started out as, um, the black agenda can sometimes get lost, particularly in the way media covers it and in the public discourse. How do we form these coalitions and not have our voices lost? I think that we've got to make it clear that coalition means shared agendas. Otherwise, it's co-option. So go back to, I mentioned uh, uh, Frederick Douglass coming from Maryland. One of the tensions, I just read uh, David Blight's book on Frederick Douglass and had him at our convention. One of the tensions Douglass had is that even the abolitionists, the white abolitionists, didn't want him to be the orator. 
William Lloyd Garrison, and he had real tension. They wanted him to be a perfect slave that they could use as a prop. And we've always got to fight to say that we will be part of an alliance or coalition, but we will not be marginalized because we have distinct issues that we have to deal with. And any time you have to take back, then that's not a coalition and you ought to resist that. All right, uh, please come to the microphones. We'll have time for a couple of questions. And, I'll and I want y'all to know in 30 years, that's the easiest interview I've ever had with E.R. Ship. <laughs> she usually beats me I down. promise I was gonna be nice. <laughs> You, I, I you, know, you I used know to this, tell me that and then still take out the razor. This, well, you said something nice about me once, so I think I owe you I one. say something nice about you all the time. <laughs> He's a Pulitzer Prize winning genius. I just wish you didn't hit me so hard, but <laughs> my mama had to beat me to make me grow, so maybe that's what she was doing. There's a time for all things, but I do have this question. Uh, I didn't want you to ask another question. Let's go to I the know, audience. I have one more question here. <laughs> In this Easter tide, the focus is on resurrection in the religious realm. Your career is a model of resurrection in the secular realm. <laughs> in the 1990s, you were deemed by many image shapers, meaning the news media and prominent leaders in the political realm, to be an ambulance chaser, a charlatan, a pretender to the throne of civil rights leader. How did you get from there here? Because I never was that. What, what the writers wouldn't deal with is I started in Dr. King's organization at 13, which you did acknowledge. And uh, they tried to make me something I wasn't. Now, did I get off track sometime? Yeah. Did I say things that we were not taught to say? Yes. But they never said he started in that movement, may have made some errors, and has to get back in line. They tried to re- they, they tried to start me at Brawley or start me at Howard Beach, and I'd already been involved for many years, so all I had to do was return to my roots and, and take the flack, as you know, from some of those I had been associated with. I never was what they said. And ain't nothing wrong with chasing ambulance if your folks is in the ambulance and the folk ain't taking them to the right place. Okay, I'm looking. Let me start on this side of the room. Now, we can't get everybody who's in that line there, so we'll do what we can. Uh, who's at the mic? Short question, please. Good evening, uh, Reverend Sharpton. My name is Darnell Ingram. I'm the director for the Office of Civil Rights for Baltimore City. Um, Brian Stevenson says most people think the opposite of uh, uh, poverty is wealth, but in many cases, the opposite of poverty is justice. And I'm trying to create an initiative to deal with e uh, economic justice. How can you, what is some advice you can help the office in developing a framework and initiative to try to create this climate of economic justice in our city. You must look at the economic data. Who does business with the city? Where are the contracts? Where are, where's the banking? And where is the income level and wage level? And move the dial, not listen to the noise, but move the dial so that the business, the contracts, the banking, and the data in terms of income and wage earnings is equal. That should be the goal. And it, the goal, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is for people to be able to live affordable lives and then build from there. If we can lift them up on an even playing field, the, the, the rest will make it up or down based on their own judgment. We're gonna take one question from here, and that might be the end of the questions, people. I'm sorry, we have to end this soon. Good evening, Reverend Al. My name is Chikuma Uku. I'm a sophomore business entrepreneurship major uh, from New York, where I've presently actually been able to sit in the House of Justice with Dr. Emily Moore, a lifetime uh, National Action Network All right. member. Uh, my question to you would be, how can any brother in this room that would like to be able to directly learn from you, how would they be able to submit a resume or, or be able to do that? <laughs> He asked the right question. Uh, well, we have, you know, we have a chapter here that you ought to be a part of, uh, that Larry Young is heading up, and you ought to be involved in the chapter, and I'm gonna be spending a lot of time with that chapter, but I, I welcome that, because we need, just like Reverend Jones and them gave me a chance, we need 
a lot of young brothers and sisters that could come and not emulate or imitate me, but find their own style. I'm as opposite to Reverend Jones as you could be, but the principles I learned from him. And I think we've got to be able to invest time in some young brothers and sisters that want to lead, and they need the experience of those of us that can tell them our experience and go on for themselves and be innovative. And I'm not going to make you conk your hair. <laughs> oh, you already solved that. <laughs> As President Wilson uh, prepares to close, I'm going to ask you a question. I remember the old Al Sharpton eating at Sylvia's in the old days. And now Sylvia's I see is the soul you, food restaurant in Now I see you parading all of these presidential candidates up to Sylvia's. So when you host these pe presidential candidates, I'm pretty sure you do not, you do not eat the cornmeal dusted catfish fried to golden perfection and served with home fries or if you're in a breakfasty mood with grits and two eggs. And surely you're not eating those short ribs of beef prepared with Sylvia's secret brown gravy or the fried chicken or the smothered chicken or my favorite chicken liver sauteed with onions and peppers. So Reverend Al. What's on your menu? What's on your plate? Well, you know, uh, six years ago, I stopped eating meat. I don't even eat chicken anymore. I eat fish once a week. And I only eat vegetables. I don't eat a lot of starch. I take two slices of whole wheat toast a day, so I have starch. I work out about five every morning. That was, I just, I, I didn't get sick. I didn't did operation. I just changed my eating style. So uh, I think candidates want to go to Sylvia's because that's the known place. And uh, I, I will not name the candidate, but a very well-known, successful politician with me at Sylvia's. And they ordered the macaroni and the potato salad and the fried chicken and the peach cobbler and looked at me with all the TV cameras and said, what you going to have, Reverend? I said, I don't eat that stuff. That stuff will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Thank Wilson. You. Okay, okay Tester. So please join me in giving a really, really warm Morgan State University round of applause to the Reverend Al Sharpton. Please. And so we have a couple of uh, tokens here for you, Reverend Sharpton. Thank you very much for coming this evening and being a part of our Morgan State University Presidential Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, first, we would just like to present this memento to you. Uh, in its, uh, it, it reads, Morgan State University, uh, Growing the Future, Leading the World, Presidential Distinguished Speaker Series, presented to Reverend Al Sharpton, April 11th, 2019. Thank you very much. And we we'll just put this aside here. We have a package for you uh, to put that in. Now, Reverend Sharpton, you uh, spoke convincingly about your encounter with uh, a young uh, person uh, who uh, was of a different political persuasion, uh, but you spoke about his going to good colleges. Uh, well, uh, we're going to give you a memento here from not a good college, but the best college in America. <laughs> right? And so uh, we want you, uh, as you uh, make your way through airports uh, and around New York City, uh, to show the world that the best college in the United States is Morgan State University. And so once again, a round of applause for Reverend Al Shopton. Thank you, and thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, have a great evening. And thank you very much for Professor E.R. Ship uh, you. for your great moderation this evening. <laughs> thank you very much. Good night.